Now that the gameplay list is done, let's look at the other side of the coin. While gameplay is obviously one of the most important elements in many games, story can just be as important if not more in certain cases. The medium of a video game allows for immersion that a movie can't deliver, and allows a level of self-discovery that you can't find in a lot of places. What I love is that you can hit such a gambit of great writing here, whether it be down-to-earth discussions in a futuristic setting, or fantastic characters that you latch onto and can't let go. These games are the best stories that 2018 had to offer. Now again, I had to play the game in order for them to be on the list. And this is my list. While my reviews are more objective, this list is purely what I think is the best. So without further ado, these are the top 15 stories in games in 2018. Oh, and my game of the year at the end. Number 15, Time Spinner. Now, this does come with a caveat. I've seen reports that people have real problems with the forced LGBTQ elements of Time Spinner. And to be quite frank with you, I haven't gotten to a point where I had even noticed it after five to six hours into the game and about half the side quests done for each side character. It actually surprised me on stream. It's possible that it forces elements towards the end of it, but frankly, the story segments in the game so far have been written rather well while still being down to earth in a fantasy setting. And that to me is more than enough to make it on the list. I love the world and the time traveling element built here. There seems to be reasonable stakes that can't be reversed on a whim, but there's a real understanding that hey, this power is actually really dangerous, which is something that I feel a lot of more time travel stories overlook. I like how the game plays off each of the side characters, realizing that you may not entirely know all their stories, especially on the villain side, but it also gives them actual passion behind their wants and beliefs. You buy a librarian being happy to share with you the history of the world and is willing to break a few procedures to do it thanks to good characterization. Our main protagonist is probably one of the better Metroidvania ones when it comes to actual interaction with the world around her, especially with other characters. You can see what drives her for forward, you can understand where she's coming from, and what kind of dilemma that she's run into. The world around her, in fact, between magic functions and overbearing governments, yeah, it's not anything new, but the twists here are at least enough to keep you wanting more, while reminding you of a certain Castlevania genre. Yeah, it's not exactly the same, but there are hints here and there. Granted, it does keep the story secondary to the gameplay, and that's why it ends up lower on this list. But for the genre of Metroidvania, it is probably up there with other indie gems such as Ghost 1.0. If you want a good indie all-around game for this genre, in fact, Time Spinner is going to be your pick of 2018. Number 14, Iconoclasts. The themes of the casual Metroidvania Iconoclasts hit a lot of what you'd see from dystopian type sci-fi plots. From overbearing governments that think they know better than you, to faith that makes you do things that you probably should know better on. You've probably seen a lot of these themes that Iconoclasts bring to the table. Yet, a reasonable set of personalities with side characters, and a charming silent protagonist that just wants the ability to fix the problems around her, will set the stage for a game that has some all right gameplay, but really succeeds in the story department in my mind. It's a game that understands that you could go with typical stereotypes in games like this, but it's even better to twist them just a little bit more so that they surprise you, while still making the decisions they make actually follow the character's personality. I've seen others describe the game as slightly off, and I think that's actually reasonable, but it does highlight that the game may end up not doing well with certain people. That offness makes it slightly unique, 
There's elements of this story that aren't told to you despite you thinking that there's probably a lot thought about by the main writers. It feels like you've only got a part of this story at times and it's holding back. The thing is, how you fill those blanks will determine how much you like this story. And the game seems to want you to come to your own conclusions. Well, beside the whole oppressive regime thing. Nevertheless, it does enough to make the list thanks to its side characters and some writing that is reasonable with some good laughs and good set pieces along the way. It doesn't necessarily take away from the more serious themes of the story, but it is nice to see a story that hits serious themes, but doesn't necessarily take itself too seriously either, and does have some good, good comedy points. I want to see more of this world in particular in the future, and it can be built upon and really have something special about it in another game or two. Number 13. Distrant 2. I've heard many people take a look at the Distraint series and immediately say it's not for them based on its unique art style, that it's ugly and the UI just doesn't work for them. To those people, I think you're very close minded because sometimes what's considered ugly is exactly what a game needs for its themes and what it wants to talk about. The fears within your mind and past decisions come to the forefront in The Distant 2, which is a small horror game about the breakdown of one's own psyche and personal demons to overcome. You're thrown into a strange world of limbo of sorts as you attempt to reconcile your past deeds and the demons of your past while investigating your own mind and how you can come back from thoughts of suicide. Those with thoughts of depression and attempting to find themselves will find a lot to relate in this story. And it does well to balance in providing hope for those afflicted in question while being realistic with the doubts and horrors that they have to deal with. Price, our main protagonist, is a character that is the right kind of flawed. There's reasons to like him, there's reasons to dislike him, but regardless, you want to root for him and have him overcome his problems. Atmosphere is the name of the game here, and I will admit that Distrant had a weird feeling of uncomfortableness from the get-go. That's the thing about the game. It's this underlying unease that exists in every scenario that propagates in each interaction that Price has, but it's not like a lot of horror games that I've played before. It's not general fear, it's not being scared of what's around the corner, it's just you questioning why the game is getting under your skin even when you're not exactly sure if it should be. It's also probably why you see a bunch of people praising the story without being very specific to what exactly they liked. I openly admit that I had problems putting together what I enjoyed about the game for a while until I really disconnected myself from the experience. Now, I would recommend playing the first game, but the second one is still this uneasy game that will make you question a lot. And so if you want to take a step back and force your mind into a place you may not be comfortable with, give it a chance. Number 12, Omen Sight. While I indicated that Omen Sight wasn't as strong as the game that it's a spiritual successor of in Stories The Path of Destinies, that doesn't mean that Omen Sight wasn't a story worth listening to. You've got several of the classic tropes of the fantasy genre here. Warring factions, an end of the world plot with one hero that will save the world, a lot of your basics. But what drives Omen Sight forward? is a set of main interesting characters that play on known tropes in the genre, but have small elements to them that drive them forward. Like a sneaky intelligent mouse that uses trickery and misdirection to get her goals, or a dedicated captain that puts the entire country's safety over everything else, even her current duty to her emperor. These characters are the main heart of the story, as their interactions help mold them over time in smart ways, keeping true to their wants and beliefs, but understanding that they may have to adapt to the new circumstances in their lives. 
It's all highlighted by strong voice acting that plays off those relationships masterfully. And it's the strongest part of the game as a whole. Now the Groundhog Day storytelling isn't anything too special in the genre here, but it allows for mystery fans to try to piece things together, attempting to find the subtext of each scene and what could be truly going on. There's some good, not great twists within the plot, but they do at least provide misdirection and more options for you, letting your mystery and your detective side run wild. The only thing that really holds it back in my opinion is the main character. The fact that you're a silent protagonist doesn't actually add anything to the plot. And the thing is, you had stories, The Path of Destinies, and its main character being such a great addition to that actual story. In the end, Omen Sight may be a step down, but it's still worth your time. And honestly, I wouldn't necessarily go and buy it right now, but when it goes on sale, you should pick it up. Especially if you have children. This is the type of game that you can get kids interested in and maybe get them a little bit more addicted to video games. Yes, I'm saying get your kids addicted to video games. Probably shouldn't be putting this in this video now, should I? Anyway. Number 11. Florence. The only mobile game on this list. Florence may look to be an artsy type of game on the surface and may feel pretentious to a lot of people. What I found, however, was a game full of heart and charm, which use simple yet effective interactions to tell the story of a young girl and her progression through her life. It's not a complicated story either. This is a tale of a simple girl with a simple relationship, and all of it is enhanced by a presentation that uses color and sound to really push the emotional ties that the player creates with these characters. It isn't a story that takes long to tell either. You can finish the story in about 90 minutes, and many people will look at the $3 price tag, and they'll for some reason scoff at that. That would be a mistake though. Florence is charmed through smiles, through hardship, through connections. Yet yeah, part of the story is sad, but what makes Florence so good is how relatable the protagonist is, how simple it keeps the interactions of the game while describing the characters in question. It hits multiple themes about putting yourself out there, trying new things, and accepting when things don't necessarily work out for you. It's the type of game that does well in setting the mood for self-reflection. Which is why many of the people who play it and get the most out of it are probably of an older generation. I know a lot of mobile-based story experiences don't resonate with people. And to be honest, I haven't necessarily run across many good ones. But Florence is worth the three bucks for the emotions you feel. And in the end, isn't that one of the main reasons we tell stories? Number 10. The Missing, J.J. Macfield, and the Island of Memories. Going into this game blind, I was sort of taken aback when I first came across my own body on the ground, wondering, wait, was that a glitch? What is going on here? And don't get me wrong, this type of plot with mysterious elements is actually right up my alley. Whether you're questioning whether all the symbolism of the monsters mean, or what kind of horrors are truly real and which ones aren't actually there. But I admit it's not necessarily what I was expecting either, as I didn't do my research on it and was expecting more visual novel elements. It was a recommendation via the Discord, which is in the description below by the way, and well, it made the list, didn't it? There's the relationship with JJ searching after her best friend Emily on the mysterious Memoria Island, where a camping trip has gone a little bit, let's say, sour. The beautiful 2.5D aesthetic has loads of small details that you could easily look over, but do add to the story in significant ways. Like how JJ starts with pulling along a doll that eventually gets burned away. Is that symbolism for her innocence being taken? Is that her growing up in a way? It's up for you to determine, 
and you'll find a lot of symbolism here in not only our main protagonist, but the different creatures and monsters that stalk her. The Missing isn't very straightforward in its storytelling, but that's just fine with me considering that one of the game's mechanics is that you die over and over again to get through its puzzles. It gives a mysterious element to it, it gives a supernatural element to it that makes you question things in the right way. What should be noted, however, is that collecting donuts in the game will unlock more and more of the story thanks to the cell phone text that the game gives you. And these give key relationships with JJ to put context to her past and maybe fill in the gaps in your mind. Now, I admit I wish there was other alternative storytelling elements besides her phone, but the use of emojis for emotional states and the variety of different conversation types with her professor, her friends, her mom, help flesh out JJ as a strong protagonist while still defining her more than just being a vessel for you. This is done by the infamous Swery, so you know you're in for a trip on this one. And while I didn't get as far as I wanted to, it did enough to make its way on the list. And maybe I'll have a five minute review of it sometime in the near future. Number nine, Stay. Yeah, you're seeing a couple of those underrated games of 2018 pop up on this list. And while Stay's problems existed more on the gameplay side of things, that's not what this list focuses on. As I mentioned in that video, you should watch it if you haven't, by the way. You play as an unknown bystander on the end of a computer, communicating with Quinn, a trapped psychologist who has no idea where he is. Don't let the mixed ratings on Steam drive you away. The unique perspective of helping someone via a computer, learning little by little but unsure what your exact role is in this actual story, is intriguing. The game has a dialogue system with four elements to it. Each response you have and decision that you make plays into the possible paths that you can take and the game has multiple endings and also affects Quinn's trust of you. There's a sense of danger around every corner here, but none of it is in your face about it. It's got degrees of subtle, which is fitting for the plot here. It makes you question whether or not there's something truly diabolical at the core here. In fact, that's what the game does best, makes you question things. See, Stay makes the list despite the writing not necessarily making sense at times. I mean, you sort of have to turn off the part of your brain that says, wait, why are you talking about the human condition and psyche in a possible situation of life and death? But it ends up leading to some interesting discussions that keep your mind trying to find the subtext and the hints of what's to come. The shotgun approach here taken and of the possible explanations at hand end up working in a roundabout way making you unable to focus on one approach, but gets your mind into overdrive. This is a horror aficionados type of game, and while I don't think it necessarily works for everyone, those kind of people, those who like those horror movies that get into your head, you'll enjoy this game. Now, it doesn't reach its full potential, as the real-time mechanic where Quinn won't trust you if you've been away from the game for a while, it's a good idea in theory, but some people do have jobs, and it's very easy to just restart a section and pretend like that never happened. But for doing something a little bit different, Stay earns its spot on the story list. Number 8. Spider-Man Look, sometimes you don't really have to make huge changes in a formula for a story to be successful. You could focus on the themes, build it up in the franchise, and while you may make small changes here and there to put a personal spin on it, there's nothing too groundbreaking. And yet it still makes you smile. That's pretty much Marvel's Spider-Man for the PS4 in a nutshell. Sure, it's got a lot of background material to work with, but frankly, each individual character and their flavor in this game's iteration pose together a reasonable story to tie the fun gameplay segments together. Now, if you've seen this channel for any frame of time, you know that first and foremost, that characters come first in my mind. 
and I like the unique take on these versions. I like that Mary Jane was an investigative reporter, harnessing her looks and go get them attitude that you know of the character from the past, but applying them to a job that I could expect her to have yet haven't seen before. I like that Aunt May is part of a homeless shelter, that she's allowed to show her kind and caring side. It's the personality traits that dominate here, and people who are fans of the franchise are going to love it. Now, of course, you have the more set pieces of the story as well, and while it is really predictable most of the time, I can't help but smile when the security forces come in to protect the city when you full know that they're going to come and bite you in the ass later on. That's the thing about superhero movies and plots. They don't always have to be too over the top or even completely blow you away in terms of how different they are, but they can be enjoyable just using classic elements of the genre. There's drama, there's the awkward romance from Peter and Mary Jane, and there's good character interactions here. That's all you need, and the villains that do get highlighted at times, especially for their motivations. I'd like to specially mention the side quest, which I thought had a little bit more personality in certain cases this time around. A lot of these open world sort of collectathon games, yeah, they have side quests and they have stories, but they don't have the personal touch to them. I in particular here like the Harry Oswald quest that had to deal with the science and the environmental portions because that really felt like they really took their time and really developed these side stories and I wanted to find the next one and the next one just to see what would happen next or what Harry did this time around. Look, it's a Spider-Man game. You're getting a good Spider-Man story here. Do you really need me to say more than that? Number 7. Cross Code I know that there have been plenty of animes about the world of MMORPGs, but I haven't seen a game that's constructed around the experience of an MMORPG before Cross Code at least. Well, besides MMORPGs themselves, but that's not really the story that I'm trying to talk about. You know what, never mind. CrossCode is a hybrid of a puzzle platformer, an RPG, shmup-like elements, and an action game. But its ability to construct a world that I wanted to explore, that played off the ideas of MMORPGs, that earned it a spot on this list. Sure, our Sphero-mancer Leia is another main protagonist with a rarely used class that gets amnesia at the start of a game, but its unique take on the silent protagonist at the start got me interested with her damaged voice segment. And having a partner that was injecting code in for you set it up a dynamic early that I wanted to see play out. The game fully runs with the large online game theme by having you meet up with characters that will leave the game and come back at times as they log out. And it helped establish this beautiful world with its consistency while still being able to explain why a forest was next to a snowy town. Characters, however, are the star here, and that's both big and small. Sure, I love the introduction of your pseudo-rivals of Emily and Apollo, and I especially loved how there were small character moments of story in battle, giving a little bit of background to some characters that made a lot of sense for the time. The game plays off the around-the-world theme with regional flared dialogue, but the big key here is that every NPC felt worthy to talk to and none of them were throwaway. The guilds and organizations had storylines that were compelling, of course, but even stopping to talk to an ice cream creator and getting a quest made me want to do those quests to see what they had to do when responding to them. The game also balances serious plot points with wacky off-the-wall comedy at times, and I never felt bored throughout the hours I played, just ready with more questions to answer about the story. Like I said with the gameplay list, CrossCode could have gotten further up the list if I was able to play more of it before the creation of it, but I have a feeling that I'm going to want to finish the game and make you all a review because quite frankly, I've enjoyed the hell out of the game so far. And I sort of need to know what happens next to Leia and her friends. Just a tiny bit. Number 6. Dragon Quest XI. 
Well, I didn't necessarily get as far as I wanted to before coming to my conclusion. It should be noted that Dragon Quest XI doesn't exactly show the signs of doing anything too unique in the genre. But a reasonable amount of the best pieces of literature over the years are all based on the same base stories. And well, that doesn't mean it's not a story to follow. Dragon Quest XI does well with a plot with a series of characters that may have stereotypical elements, but that doesn't mean that they aren't interesting. From a seemingly child mage who's a lot more mature than at first glance, to a flamboyant jester who may be more of a chivalrous knight than a court laughingstock. These characters tag along with great localization that add regional flavor to the characters that help pull the world together. In fact, the regional element is throughout the game. Each of these cities that you come across feel like their own world, and yet the worlds connect together smartly from place to place. The lighthearted division of serious elements and more comedic elements in the writing works in keeping you entertained, as the game does get several laughs out of you while not taking away from the big dramatic set pieces. The best way I can summarize Dragon Quest XI is a JRPG evening sitcom. It's written in a way that everyone can enjoy what's here, including references to Puff Puff. But like a fantastic sitcom, it's the small character interactions, even with small characters like NPCs, that help peel back a layer of exposition and a foreshadowing of key events that can really reward those who pay attention. Look, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that Dragon Quest XI is going to blow you away. Sure, I love a good amount of the characters, but there are JRPGs that have done it better. But I also want to keep playing to see the rest of the story. And considering how many games I play and try to review despite my limited time, that should say something in of itself. Number 5. The Red Strings Club. To be perfectly honest, I sort of am surprised that Red Strings Club ended up this low on the list. And I know it's in the top half, but seriously, the game's first vibes that I got from it was another type of Valhalla game, a bartending setting where you could discuss issues of the world, focus on interesting characters, and some cyberpunk type elements. This time around, however, it goes for ethical questions about elements of technology and the personality versus the greater good, and does well in the cyberpunk setting, despite some of the writing being a little bit too much on the nose at times. Emotion is used rather well in the writing here, in particular in the bartending gameplay elements, where the whole gimmick is the type of drinks that you give your clients end up changing their emotions and their behavior. I will admit that when it comes to that segment of the storytelling, Red Strings Club is a bit more clear with your effects than Valhalla was, and it makes you feel like your choice of drink is causing a little bit more of the story directly, meaning that you act as its central fulcrum. These choices lead to set pieces that keep elements of the story compelling, but unlike with Valhalla, the main story here is the conflict at the core of the mystery, and not the characters. It's probably why I didn't like it as much as Valhalla, despite characters that have good quirks to them, but they aren't the ones that are supposed to shine here, and it does show at times. With that said, it approaches themes of cyberpunk rather well, in particular handling elements of individuality and what it means to be human rather nicely providing good social commentary, and allowing a little bit of leeway when it comes to right and wrong. Now this is not a social justice warrior type game like some people have labeled it. Quite far from it. This is a cyberpunk game. One theme of cyberpunk is social justice. You should expect that in your game. If you want a game that will make you sit back and think about the current world and where we are at as a society, the Red Strings Club does a great job of commenting on that without commenting on recent controversies in the modern day life. It's a story that obviously uses influences from the world, but doesn't beat you over the head with it, well, most of the time. 
it's definitely worth a pickup in the end. Number four, Unavowed. To be honest, I'm actually sort of surprised that Unavowed showed up this low on this list this year. I mean, it's a must buy for those who love the supernatural Lovecraftian world. And it's made by Wajek Games, who have constantly produced fantastic point and click adventure games such as Kathy Rain and Techno Babylon. Much like at the time it came out, it ended up getting overshadowed by other fantastic games in the story segments. But don't let that stop you from actually picking up Unavowed. You would be making a huge mistake if you did. A game about a group of protectors that help the world against supernatural threats. The game's foundation lies with a set of interesting main characters. From an accountant turned fire mage, to a police officer who's seen a little bit too much shit. What's great here is the characters themselves aren't just their role. Each of them provide a good personality and backstory beyond their profession. And it's one of the reasons why you want to see and talk to them at every opportunity. These characters move a story forward involving mind control, territory disputes, and warring fish people. And yes, it is as interesting as the combinations of those sound, and even more so. Character dialogue is smartly written with small hints of what's to come hidden in the subtext of conversations. And it helps that all the gameplay actions by these characters make sense for the character's personality and perspective wise. It's all driven by some fantastic voice acting, and it helps complement an old style, but a reasonably fun presentation. The game also has reasons to play it multiple times, as being able to take different paths regarding who your character from the start is can result in vastly different opening sequences. Now, it doesn't necessarily change up the great set pieces that the game builds upon itself, but does enough to make you feel like your choices in the games matter. Honestly, it may be one of the best from Wadjet Eye games, which is saying a lot considering how much I love Techno Babylon. So, take a chance when you can. Number 3 God of War. 2000's me would be really confused right now if he was able to see these lists. I mean, God of War's story element is higher on this list than its equivalent gameplay version, and who saw that coming? Well, the new direction of God of War 2018 shows that regardless of how a series started, it can go in a completely new direction story-wise at the drop of a hat while still feeling familiar. And thankfully, this new direction for God of War has pushed it into elite company. God of War took the angry Kratos and the tragedy of the old games and retooled him into a father in the latest iteration with an alive son. And needless to say, a masterpiece was born from it. The star of the game is the interactions between Kratos and his son Atreus. As Kratos struggles between caring for the well-being of a growing child while attempting to teach him the skills that he needs to survive. It's very easy to miss a lot of the subtlety of their interactions though, as small changes in Kratos' voice can really add a new layer of depth to some of their interactions. What compounds it is a capable young Atreus, meaning that he does not feel like some sort of escort quest steer, but an actual partner with his knowledge granted to him by his mother, but his cleverness in situations helping them as well. Granted, the change to Norse mythology and the idea of Kratos meeting these new sets of gods to kill would have been interesting to begin with, but it's also the new world that sets God of War apart in many ways. Segments like the Light vs. Dark Elves tell small stories that Kratos uses to teach his son, but makes you want to know more about the world and how it's been constructed, especially with the rotating hub that centers it. It helps that the series of side characters you run across add little pieces bit by bit while not distracting from your attention to your ultimate goal. These are good side stories that connect to the main plot without overwhelming it, in, basically. Honestly, this could have been higher on the list, 
but a certain reveal was given away thanks to a YouTube recommendation algorithm showing a part of it, enough that it was easy to see something coming beforehand. Needless to say, that's a reason why algorithms were on my disappointments of 2018 list. But it should say the strength of the storytelling, regardless of that spoiler section, that the game was still able to make number three on this list. I mean, I'm a guy who likes twists. I'm a guy who likes the unknown. And the fact that it was able to do it just by the strength of the writing alone, even though I knew somewhat was coming, yeah, that worked. That worked rather well. Number 2. Return of the Obra Din. By far, Return of the Obra Din is one of the best alternative storytelling experiences I've ever encountered. I say alternative because never has a game told a story to me in this way, and it plays to my love of mystery and to detective stories, but does it with minimal audio and voice interactions despite those being there being fantastic. It solely relies on visual and written down clues, and it allows for enough manipulation of your mind to fill in the pieces that it doesn't tell you, but gives you enough for a basis of these characters that makes a solid foundation and makes you want to finish the story. More than any other game this year, I described Return of the Obra Dinn as my form of gaming crack. And to be completely honest, it almost took the number one spot here, and part of me really wanted to make it and the last game co-number ones. But we'll get to that in a bit. The developer Lucas Pope understands how to focus storytelling. The idea of a story being told by seeing key events of each of the corpses you run across is fascinating here giving you a snapshot of the chaos, but not necessarily all the context at times. Like a good detective, however, you need to use the clues that it gives you, and that's where Obra Dinn is at its best. Those clues. It's those things like how the visuals here are purposeful, so that focus on key elements and not necessarily the color in front of you help you refine your thoughts. It's that presentation that draws out things that you may never have seen before, like how you notice groups of people hanging with each other due to their shared job, or how emotions on faces and where their eyes are actually looking can tell a whole different story in of itself. You left enough clues here so that you have to understand and go through them, but you don't get bogged down in it. It actually drives you forward because you want to know what the truth of this story was. And the way that the corpses are laid out in this boat is actually really smart. Getting some of the end game at the start and then having to piece together exactly what's going on in most cases. This is the type of story that makes you sit back and reflect on your own life what you're missing from your interactions around you based on what you're seeing in front of you in this game. And frankly, it's surprising how much the game does, despite not having necessarily the strong characters being put in front of you, but having you mold the characters yourself. In fact, of all the games I can think of, Obra Dinn surprised me that it was as successful as it was, because a lot of the storytelling is put in the hands of the player. They're given a blank slate, and only poked and prodded to get the story. And I expected the ADD culture that we are in now to not actually enjoy the game as much as I did, but lo and behold they do. But my god, Lucas Pope is a master of his craft between this and Papers, Please, and I cannot think of a game that shows off story creativity more than this one. Buy it. Buy it now. Number 1. Wonder Song. Wonder Song is actually very different from the stories that I usually love. I mean, let's look at a lot of my favorite story games of all time. Danganronpa is a dark version of Phoenix Wright mixed with Battle Royale. Valhalla addresses complex themes of personal responsibility plays off strong characters and their needs, and doesn't pull punches on its issues. 
None of these and others are bright balls of sunshine of any sort, which makes Wonder Song stand out like a sore thumb. But in any Hall of Fame, there's specialists of all sorts, and like Mariano Rivera of the latest Hall of Fame class, Wonder Song shines as one of the best in its category. A story of a bard who's thrown into saving the world with gathering segments of the Earth Song. Our bard takes on the world with the demeanor of a 90s Sunday morning cartoon protagonist. His cheery nature is infectious, but what sets him apart from others like him is that it's clear that he's also down to earth and does have his troubles. He doesn't just win with the power of friendship and a cheery attitude. He has to work for it and use his skills wisely. It helps that he embodies what many players would want to be from the beginning, and the clever use of a singing mechanic and how it immerses you in the story makes you appreciate him that much more. But the smart pairing of him to Miriam, the witch yang to his ying, plays off a budding relationship that makes them both grow as individuals while still keeping their personalities intact. To be quite honest, the buddy cop-like partnership is what makes Wonder Song so good. And there's really great set pieces along the way, including a club scene that will stick with me for years to come. It also helps that many of the other side characters are memorable in some unique way, making you want to find them and finish off their arcs wherever the story takes you along these beautiful, beautiful worlds. It should be noted that Wonder Song is based off the people that the developer met on a road trip, and that's the thing. That separates the game from others story-wise. It's clear that those experiences were channeled so smartly, emotionally and narratively into the game, and thus it makes it feel like a road trip of your own. The thing is, I don't want to say any more about the game because every element of it is an experience to have, more than many others, including some of my past favorites in the genre. Yes, it's not gameplay heavy and has some faults there, but when it comes to a story that will act as a remedy to your damaged soul, Wonder Song is the best medicine you could ever have. Pick up the game. But okay, even with my two lists, I do like giving an overall game of the year. And of all the games that I mentioned, there were four that fought for the overall top spot. God of War, Wonder Song, Return of the Obra Dinn, and Dead Cells. Each of them have their own strengths, and that made it hard to choose just one in the end. So when it comes to my game of the year, I considered a variety of factors. How long do I think I'd remember the game's experience on me? Will I come back to it? Did specific moments stick out? Did it do something really unique in the genre? I went back and forth a bit, but I ultimately came to one decision. There was a game that engrossed me from start to finish without letting go, and didn't take out its claws of me until the end credits. Even with the other three games, I had a lot of addictive moments with them, but not like this one. I needed to know the end, I needed to know what the whole story was. So my game of the year is Return of the Obra Dinn. Return of the Obra Dinn is absolutely a godsend of purposeful and restricted design. It's addition by subtraction here. Lucas Pope made sure that there wasn't too many stimuli for a player to get bogged down in, but enough to tickle their investigative funny bone and allow for possibilities for Wu could have done it to run free. It's a game that focuses on imagination and a puzzle that's not directly mechanical, and that feels like a lost art in today's modern video game landscape. It towed the line between great frustration and overwhelming rapture as you cross another three people off your list. That threes mechanic that doesn't confirm anything until you get the right three is the perfect length. So that you can jed, you can't just wildly stab at the dark to get things right, but when coming down to the right combination of things, you can take a stab in the dark to have it work out if you've narrowed it down enough. 
The one complaint that I have heard from a lot of people about the game is that it's got no replay value. And yes, I will concede that. And it made me pause when thinking about putting it as the overall game of the year. But here's the thing. For me, replay value is lower on my list of things, too many games to play and all. But besides that, I'd rather have a really interesting first game playthrough that sticks with me rather than a game that sorta of does okay, but that I can replay. But the funny part about Return of the Obra Dinn is that I'm craving a replay of the game, even though I know exactly what the game would have to offer. It's the mechanics and the way that it brought everything together that makes me salivate for another game of this type, and unfortunately, I can't think of anyone that hits this right away. Sure, there's mystery games, sure I can go back and play Danganronpa, but the fact is, this one stands out as being a detective game. The true and utter detective game. So joining the ranks of games like Rocket League, like Valhalla, Return of the Obra Dinn is my game of the year. And quite honestly, is up there when I think about my favorite games of all time. So that should say something for ya. That's it for all my years list this year. I know that they took a lot longer than I wanted it to, and I apologize for that, but I did want them to be a comprehensive list. But with this out of the way, I can get back to my regular review content. I'm hoping that I can refine my processes going forward to get content a little bit more regular on that side, and that I can cover smaller things more frequently, but also be able to, you know, job search and everything like that in a reasonable time frame. Anyway, if I missed a great story this year, leave it in the comments section below. And I'm going to be working on giveaway tools and request tools programming wise so that some of the maintenance stuff of the actual channel comes a little bit easier to me. Anyway, that's it for now. And as always, keep on gaming.